All right, I think uh, we can start. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marco Carmazzini. I'm one of the product managers uh, with the Oracle Database Backup and Recovery uh, team. And um, what I'm going to talk today is um, ransomware protection and cyber resilient architectures with a zero literacy recovery appliance. Um, Ransomware protection is a hot topic, uh, obviously, for, for everyone. And um, we frequently have questions from customers about, you know, what can we do with the recovery plans, how we can address cyber resilience and, and cyber recovery uh, using the recovery plans. And there are a few options that we uh, we discussed and, you know, customer made some decisions to go one way or the other. So uh, what I'm going to uh, present to you today is really you know, what those options are and what can be done. Um, first of all, oh, if you have questions, um, you know, as you're probably already familiar, use the Q&A button and uh, I will uh, I will try to answer them at the end of the presentation. Uh, maybe in the meantime, some someone has from my colleagues will join and they'll be able to also address the questions as we go. <clears throat> so um, I have some statistics here about, you know, uh, how bad a, a ransomware attack can be uh, in terms of, you know, what the payments were, how much people had to pay, uh, the average total cost. These are, by the way, US-based statistics. Uh, you can find different statistics specific for certain countries, but the bottom line is really not what the number is, uh, is that, uh, you know, how critical it is. Uh, it's today's, you know, uh, ransomware is definitely the greatest threat to business survival. Um, and, you know, it, no matter what the actual cost is, the most if you want, uh, frightening of this statistic is really, you know, the average life cycle of a data breach, right? 314 days, seven months to identify. And based on the thing I would tell you in a moment, it, it's really, uh, it's really staggering, right? It means that someone uh, was able to penetrate uh, a network from a for an organization or a company and, and living there for, for seven months uh, before someone actually found out. So you can imagine the potential damage that then can that they can do. Um, this is even more scary if you think about, you know, uh, this type of attacks being carried out against databases. Um, the fact that, you know, uh, the, the transaction stops on your databases if the, the, the infrastructure is, is taken down and the risk of, business impacts, the risk of, of, of really uh, cost, but also the cost in terms of, of reputation. Uh, you know, almost everywhere uh, there are regulations that says if you if you suffer a ransomware attack, you have to disclose it, you have to make it public. And, and so it, even from an reputation perspective, it's, it's extremely dangerous. So how is, has ransomware evolved? This slides I, I stole from our uh, network and security uh, colleagues from from OCI um, but I think that they're um, you know a good a good way of introducing uh, you know how the recovery plans can help with that um the you know today a ransomware attacks you know as I was saying before you know the seven months time before identifying that someone is there uh, you know lurking on your data um the it it's totally different from how it, it was in, in the beginning. A ransomware attack in the beginning was just a malware that was generically distributed, like you throw an, a net and you see, you know, what fish you you can you can catch. No control. It was just you know randomly distributed. Someone downloaded a file and you know was not particularly uh, careful, and uh, they ended up with a laptop encrypted, and maybe you know they were connected to a network share, and so some other files were encrypted. That that was it and you had to pay if you wanted to get the data back but you know it was a kind of the blast radio was the radius was was kind of small uh nowadays it's it's not like that anymore uh, nowadays you have these criminal organizations that that tries to you know also sometimes leveraging services that are available in the dark web so really similar to software as a service some also call it ransomware as a service right uh, and they they use targeted attacks they create a list of the organization the companies they want to target they send 
phishing emails and you know and it's very easy for someone to again be a little distracted click on somewhere and what they get is not the laptop encrypted they really get some kind of, of agent that someone uh, of this from from this criminal organization then start using to connecting to your your laptop and start uh, moving laterally on your network and discovering uh, what storage locations they can find what backup application you're using what database and most importantly they try to try to steal credentials right and and uh, from that it's all you know just uh, time that they spend trying to make things work and obviously the other thing they try to do always is exfiltrate data they try to steal data so that even if you recover your data they can still threat you by saying, yeah, okay, you recover data, but I have your data that I can disclose, sell, put out somewhere if you don't pay the ransom. So it's extremely important you know, to have all your data encrypted. Um, the point is, uh, it's not just a matter uh, of identifying some piece of malware like with an antivirus or not that type, similar type of approach that may infect your, your computer. It, it's really important to be able to identify all the signs that can um, that can identify, that can indicate, I should say, uh, that there is an attack in progress, uh, which it, again must just be someone uh, trying to connect to your devices and try to disable your backups, steal your data, et cetera, et cetera. The, the fact is that there is now more emphasis in data resilience contingencies. Uh, it, it's, there is more emphasis on how you respond and recover uh, on your data because it, you know, it's very likely that, that an attack will happen, but how you respond to it, it's important. And, and, and how you respond to it is having a, a sound cyber resilience uh, um, procedure in place. So what you do in case something happens. Um, and in terms of being able to recover your data, which is the last line of defense in this type of situations, um, it, it is something that, that must be specifically planned for. Uh, you cannot just say, okay, I have my backups in case I restore the backup. No, because it's different than just a generic disaster recovery. There are things that must be uh, taken into consideration before and be, must be planned for before. Um, it's important that the, the solution you're using uh, planning for this this cyber recovery strategy um, includes enhanced enhanced data integrity checking. You want to make sure that your database backups. I'm saying database because this is generic. We're talking we're talking about database now. Your database backups are valid. That you can recover if anything happens, and you want to be alerted. Uh, if something is wrong with your backups. Um, you must maintain TD encryption across all the life cycles. Uh, I was saying before, data exfiltration is one of the biggest threat when this type of attacks. So you want to make sure that if someone steals your data, but not only your data, even if someone steals your backup somehow, uh, those would not be usable. They would not be uh, used in our case. Uh, not, you, you don't want these criminals to be able to use your database backups to restore your database and find all your data. So encryption must be maintained across the whole life cycle from the database itself to the database backups. Uh, you want your solution to have separation or to provide separation of duties. You don't want a single administrator to be able to destroy your database and your backups at the same time. You want these administrator to be separate. So if someone steals uh, the credentials of a database administrator, that credential, that, that user would not be able to uh, destroy your backups as well. Um, you want to maintain administrative, logical, and physical separation uh, from the primary backup and recovery infrastructure. You want to have a location where your backups are kept safe and uh, not normally accessible on your network. So again, if anything happens, you still have a second chance of getting your uh, data restored uh, from a safe place. Um, the You want to be able to recover up to the last moment if possible, uh, so that uh, in case something happens, you don't lose a lot of data. You recover up basically to the last second before the disaster or the attack happened. 
and you want to be able to do it quickly okay and that's uh, you know also also very important you don't want to uh, have to uh, have your infrastructure down for many days until you sort out how you can recover what you can recover and how long it can take to recover your data so all these things that are generic uh, but match very well uh, what uh, you can do with the zero data roster recovery appliance which is an oracle um, uh, database engineer ransomware protection solutions. It's an engineered system. It's built on an uh, Exadata platform, and it is designed uh, for recovery, first of all. It's not designed for backup. The main idea behind the recovery plans is easy and and and, and, and fast recovery. Um, so zero error recovery. You can recover up to the last transaction. A fast database restore through incremental forever. You always restore your last full backup and have a continuous validation on your backup so that you are uh, guaranteed that if you if you need to restore your backups, you will not find surprises like corruptions or something that you know may render your store unusable. Um, your your data are continuously validated. We will we'll talk more about this. Um, it's built on a resilient architecture. So it's built on the Exadata platform. It provides separation of duties, so you can have different administrators, multiple administrators also on the recovery plans where certain operations require a quorum. So you need multiple users to agree that you know someone must, I don't know, do apply a patch and needs to be root for a certain short period of time, so that no single user can do uh, can do damage. You can enable immutable backup policies, so uh, no one can delete the backups that are protected uh, under the immutable time. And um, as we're saying, it's built on the Exeter platform, which is part of the maximum security architecture. The way the recovery plans is built make it very difficult to be able to uh, access or to have access to the backups that are stored in it. It can only be accessed through the Armin, through the uh, Armin uh, protocol and through the real-time redo transport protocol. There is no NAS exposed on the network. There is no sh network share exposed on the network from where a malicious actor can access your backup, copy them, damage them, delete, encrypt, whatever. It's all protected through a, um, um, a you know, a highly, um, contained, I would say, architecture. And it can be deployed in an air gap uh, fashion. We'll, we'll talk a lot more about two or three solutions in terms of architecture, but this is the most common requirement, uh, which is I want to have a copy of my backup stored in a location which is normally disconnected from my production network. So even if someone can do damage on my production, I can still have a place which is normally not accessible, uh, where I know my backups are stored and, and I will be able to recover from there. Uh, in, in this type of architecture also, there is an additional level of separation of duties because the administrators that manage the recovery plans in the cyber vault are different from the administrators that manage, manage the recovery plans on, on production. And it provides a lot of, of audit and compliance reporting to make sure everything is, is working. Fine. Um, so what it is and how does it work? So first of all, all the um, supported database versions uh, running on any supported platforms uh, can send backups to the recovery plans. Um, there are two ways we use to transfer the data to the recovery plans and to provide uh, real-time transaction protection. Um, one is through real-time redo transport, which is the same technology that is used by DataGuard. But in the recovery plans, there is no standby. Those, those changes that are coming directly from the redo logs in the database memory and are immediately sent to the recovery plans, those are not applied anywhere. They are just stored in the recovery plans as archive log backups. Um, instead of waiting for the redo log to be switched and then, then archived on disk as an archive log and then be picked up by a backup application that is copying the archive log to the backup destination. In this case, we have a continuous stream. We don't go through the archive log on disk. Data is sent directly from the database memory to the recovery appliance. And, and the 
the archive log backup copy is created by the recovery appliance inside the recovery appliance. That's one way of we use to transfer the data and to provide um, real-time transaction protection. Uh, the other ways is through incremental forever backups. The first backup that is done to the recovery appliance is a full backup. After that, only incremental backups are sent and the recovery appliance receives the incremental backup and combines, so create a virtual full backup by combining a kind of set of pointers, if you want, uh, to the old blocks that have not changed in the last in the last uh, in the last incremental, uh, plus the new one that came in with the new incremental, it combines them together, creating a virtual full representation. So there is no space uh, consumption to do that. There is no processing in terms of having the same way that Armand does and other backup solutions that also claim they can do incremental forever backups uh, are actually doing, which is using Armin incrementally updated backups. Uh, that's not the case. We don't do that. Uh, the recovery plans just create virtual full uh, by combining, as I was saying, the uh, previous blocks with the new one coming in with the latest incremental and maintaining basically uh, a set of full backups. Every time a new incremental comes in, a new virtual full is created. Um, there is no other processing on the database server other than sending an incremental and that's done. Those backups can be stored in any mutable fashion uh, so that no one can delete them and they are validated uh, on the recovery plans at different stages and also continuously over time. Um, immutable backups also help with compliance uh, and specifically, and, and here you you have a link, you'll, you'll find it later, maybe, I don't know, Kelly or Tim can put the link uh, to this uh, assessment in the, in the chat. It's, um, it's an assessment done by a third party uh, auditing company uh, that uh, evaluated the recovery plans features against the SEC 17A4F uh, compliance requirements, a fin financial industry uh, type of compliance requirement. And not only this one, a couple of more, I think two or three more uh, type of regulations for the financial sector. Um, so the immutable backups help also, not only with ransomware protection, but also with compliance for financial companies. The recovery plans can also replicate to a target recovery appliance. And this is how we build the cyber resilient uh, or, or if you want cyber vault uh, architecture, uh, where you have a network that is normally disconnected, usually through a firewall and, and by enabling or disabling certain rules on the firewall, uh, the replication can happen only at certain point in time. And it means that the network is normally not accessible. The cyber vault is normally not accessible. So if a malicious actor can do some damage on the production side, you have a place which was not online at the time, not accessible at the time, and you can um, recover from, from there. It can also send copies of backups to external locations like OCI object storage uh, or ZFS object storage. So either in the public cloud or on premises. Uh, on um, on destinations that use also immutable rules, immutable backups, a worm-like destination, I don't know what you want to call them, but the point is um, locations where once the data is written, it cannot be deleted or overwritten uh, for a period of time that you that you decide on the policy, can be, I don't know, days, whatever, right? So if you set policy that says data must remain immutable for 30 days in this bucket, we send the backup there and no one can delete, no one can overwrite those backup for 30 days. So it's an additional way of having a protection against uh, against ransomware attacks. Uh, and obviously this can happen also inside the cyber world if you want. The other important thing is, is uh, I mentioned TD encryption, you know, uh, protecting against exfiltration. The data should be 
encrypted at the database level. You should use TD encryption at the database level. And it's maintained encrypt, encrypted across the whole life cycle. It's never encrypted to be processed at any at any stage. And now uh, with the latest uh, software version under the Covered Plans 23.1 that was introduced a couple of weeks ago, uh, we can also compress encrypted backups. Um, and, and this is also unique because normally no other solution can compress. I mean, in general, it's impossible to compress encrypted data. In this case, we can do it because we apply compression before encryption, and the data is, again, maintained in compressed encrypted format like all, the, all the way, saving at least two to three times uh, in terms of space consumption on the on the on your backup on your backup location through to this feature. <clears throat> now. Um, I talked about uh, validation. So across all this process, the data is maintained encrypted, but it also validated. Okay, the fact that it's encrypted does not affect the fact that we continuously validate uh, the the backup data, and we don't do this at the storage block level. Uh, we do this at the Oracle block level because we understand what an Oracle block is, and and it means that if we want to entertain the idea that someone may tamper with the Oracle data on the Oracle database and then do some malicious stuff. Again, I don't know what that could be, but let's assume we say, okay, let's pretend it's possible and someone find tomorrow a way of doing this type of things. Well, if that happens, uh, the, when we do the backup, given we are not backing up files, we are not moving the data outside of the database. We are reading the data from the database through Armin and said, okay, send the changed blocks only. Uh, when that happens, the blocks are validated. So uh, it, if anything, if anyone was able to tamper with that block, we would detect that there is a corruption and that would be flagged as a corruption and an alert would be generated that the data is corrupted something is wrong so you can go and take a look if uh, maybe it's something technical or something weird happened or uh, maybe i don't know someone is doing something so you want to to uh, take care of that um if we want to go a step forward and say, okay, now let's assume that something happens, not at the database when we are reading the data, but as the data is being transferred over the network, let's assume someone can can interject and, and make some malicious tampering with those data. Um, well, the data is revalidated when it's received on the recovery plans. When the the data comes into the come into the recovery plans, it's it's stored on on flash storage. It's opened and it's processed by the recovery plans to create the virtual full. At that point, each individual Oracle database block is also validated. And again, if anything is is wrong with it, then it's gonna be flagged and and an alert is generated. Once the initial processing is done and the data is stored on the recovery plans disks, it's also continuously validated over time. Things do not stop there. Over time, it's continuously validated. So again, if anything is wrong, if anything malicious happens, uh, that would be flagged that there is a corruption, that your backup is not valid, it cannot be restored or whatever. Alert is generated, you can go and take care of that. Similar thing happened for data transferred to the cloud or data transferred to the Vault appliance, where it's also revalidated again on the target appliance, whether it's a just disaster recovery or a cyber vault recovery appliance. So incremental is transfers, transferred, is reprocessed, and uh, and um, and again, it's, it's validated again. And across this whole life cycle, there is no data decryption. We don't need to decrypt the data and uh, the encryption keys remain with the source database and normally. And if that that's the case, then even if someone would able to read this, backups would be completely useless, okay? Now, next step, separation of duty. That's the other thing that was uh, uh, mentioned earlier as one of the things to implement to, um, to go towards a cyber resilient uh, solution, okay? And uh, what does it mean? Uh, what, what does separation of duty 
mean? It means that you'll have your database administrators managing your databases uh, that are allowed to, yeah, obviously, you know, do the usual operational activity on the database and also send backup and do recovery, right? So send backups to the recovery plans, initiate restores when needed, uh, but they don't have uh, the ability to delete backups. Uh, a delete backup operation done by Armin by a DBA would be rejected by the recovery plans. They don't have to worry about the retention time or recovery window or for how long you want to keep the data. All those information are managed uh, by the uh, recovery plans administrator, who is in charge for defining the policies, for example, so for how long uh, certain database backups must be kept. And uh, it, obviously the Data, the recovery plans administrator does not have access to the database. So the recovery plans administrator would not be able to do any damage on a database. The database administrator would not be able to do any damage on a recovery plans. Uh, if you build a, a cyber vault or if you have a replica recovery plans, even if it's not in a cyber vault, you can also have a different set of recovery plans administrators to manage it. So in case someone steal the credential of a DBA, um, they would not be able to do any damage on the recovery plans. If someone steal the uh, credentials of the recovery plans administrator uh, on the production side, they would not be able to do any damage on the uh, appliance in the replica or on the target application side, whether it's a DR replica or, or a cyber vault. The other thing I want to mention, I remember if I mentioned it earlier, but um, we also have a quorum mechanism in place on the recovery plans. So certain operations that can be really damaging, like having a root user connect to the recovery plans, those are only allowed if a quorum of recovery plans administrators are in agreement for doing that. If a user um, I don't know, has some support procedure to apply or um, apply patches or something that require root privileges, they cannot just do a sudo and become root easily. Uh, a recovery plans administrator must request approval from two other recovery plans administrators who must say, yes, okay, go ahead and become root because I know you are doing this and it's the same thing and you can go ahead and do it. Otherwise, that would not be possible. So again, if someone steal the credential of a recovery plans administrator, they will not be able to do you know, this, this big damage. The other thing I want to mention is about immutable backups. Um, uh, again, I, I, talked about this about compliance a moment ago. Um, the recovery plans has basically two, two type of defining retention. You have what we call a recovery window goal, which is a goal in this example here that's set to 30 days. It means that the backup sent from these databases that are using this policy will be kept on the recovery plans for 30 days, or I should say. It means that the recovery plans would be a, uh, allowing a restore uh, for any point in time in the past 30 days, okay? Um, that, that's the goal. There are conditions that I'd go into, but especially, you know, in terms of space management, say space pressure, et cetera, where the recovery plans can reduce that uh, 30 days to a smaller number to make up space for incoming backups, for example, and don't, no, we don't have time to go into that details right now, but the point is, uh, you can also define what we call an immutable recovery window. Recovery, a immutable recovery window is a compliance recovery window is a strict uh, um, requirement. In this example, it's 14 days. It means that no one can delete backups, so do no one co can go below the 14 days. Even if the recovery plans administrator changes this policy today and set this immutable window to uh, seven days, those backups that were that came in when the set the, the the policy was set to 14 days will be kept to for 14 days, no matter what. Okay. This is important, not only in terms of, again, ransomware protection, but also in terms of compliance when, when it's needed. The same type of policies, but with different settings. In this example, they are set, both the primary and the cyber vault are set to the same settings, but they can be set differently. can be longer, can be shorter, what you set in the cyber vault on in a generic graphic. 
uh, in OCI, you can also define uh, immutable buckets. You can define policies that says, uh, I mentioned this already, uh, I want to have the data in this bucket in being mutable for a period of time. And that can be also an additional level of protection. And we will go a little more in, into this in a moment when now, you know, having set the stage, um, we can discuss, okay, but what can I do in terms of architecture? What, what, uh, in which way I can implement a recovery plans or recovery plans uh, in in my environment, and and get the the best I can in terms of uh, cyber resilience or cyber protection. So the easiest, though I wouldn't say the easiest, but the thing that. Uh, no, can be done even with a single recovery appliance. Uh, certain customers do not want, for some reason, have two, three, or don't want to have additional recovery appliance dedicated only to the cyber world. Uh, but a lot of the things I mentioned earlier uh, gave you an idea of what the recovery appliance by itself can already do uh, in in helping with with uh, be with having a, a cyber resilient architecture. Um, but one of the thing is definitely. Uh, using um, copy or copying your, your backups to an uh, OCI, to a cloud bucket, and have the cloud bucket configured with immutable, uh, with an immutable policy, with a retention policy. Um, the data in the buckets cannot be re-encrypted, for example, by some maliciously trying to block your backups, cannot be deleted. Uh, no one, the buckets can be configured, the policy can be configured in a way that is locked. And when it's locked, not even the tenancy administrator responsible for, for that um, OCI account uh, can go and change and reduce the policy or remove the policy from the bucket. It becomes impossible for everyone to delete anything. So it's a safe place where you can we can store your backups. All the data, even if your databases are not de-encrypted, all your backups sent to the recovery appliance are encrypted uh, by the recovery appliance. Uh, keys are not stored on the recovery appliance, are stored on an external uh, key vault, Oracle key vault, a key manager. And um, it means that even if someone can steal the credentials, the, the, the OCI cloud credentials, and download all the content of the bucket, uh, that would be useless. Data are encrypted, keys are on premises in Oracle Key Vault. No one can do anything with those data. So you have a place which gives a good level of um, confidence that uh, data is useless for exfiltration purposes and also is uh, not, um, it, it cannot be deleted or, or modified by anyone. This can also help if customers want to have a clean room in in OCI. A clean room is a place where you can, in case of a ransomware attack, you can recover your data. Um, production is usually not the first place you want to restore to the situation. You want to take time to analyze exactly what happened. There is some forensics to be done, etc. So you want to recover in a different place. In this way, you can recover uh, in OCI or Nexus CS or you know, database services or other databases that you manage directly. And, um, and uh, you have your data already in OCI. So it's also kind of fast to restore. A similar approach can be used on premises um, where the recovery is, uh, where the backup is sent to a ZFS using the OCI interface. So same logic applies, data encrypted by the recovery plans, st keys are not stored on ZFS, and, uh, and, and uh, retention policy is applied, so data becomes immutable. And, uh, and you have a similar approach if you want in OCI. It's a kind of first step if you want. It's not an air gap solution. Uh, we know that in certain situations, it's necessary to have an air gap solution because if there are regulations, sometimes it's insurance companies that sell uh, policies against ransomware attacks that uh, require an air gap uh, solution in place. Uh, but sometimes customers want just to have a first step and and um, and and you know do not 
need or do not want to have uh, multiple recovery appliances in place. That's one step. Um, there is a second step, if you want, or a second architectural option, uh, which is basically relying on disaster recovery and use the disaster recovery as a cyber vault location. In this case, uh, it's not, a, again, it's not a true cyber vault. It's not, there's no air gap because to maintain a disaster recovery, you must have continuous uh, access to the, the to the data DC2 in this example, to the DR uh, site, so data can be uh, continuously replicated to the DR site. Um, but you still have all the previous things that I mentioned, the separation of duty, the continuous validation, uh, the uh, encryption that is maintained across the whole life cycle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you don't have air gap. This also means that you don't have gap in RPO that we will talk about in a moment uh, because you can con basically recover up to the last second on both on both sides. Um, validation happens on, on, on both sides. It's, um, it, I mean, it's a, a good solution in terms of, uh, okay, I hope or expect that only my primary site could be targeted and not the DR site. Okay, so that that's that's one case. Um, this can also be complemented, as we said before. So everything we said before for having the additional copy in an immutable location, etc., happens in this case too. It's thus it is just uh, option one uh, with a plus that you know says okay, you have an alternate location uh, which you may try to recover from up to the last transaction. Uh, before you really have to go and, and restore to the copy that is in the immutable location, okay? And then we have what we, uh, you know, uh, recommend. We've been introduced, uh, you know, as a first solution in terms of uh, cyber vault location. And this what really, uh, you know, uh, matches all the common requirement in terms of cyber recovery, which is air gap, separated copy and beside again everything we said before which is obviously part of this solution as well the separate uh, separation of duty the um, validation continuous validation etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, in this case you have a disconnected normally disconnected network environment uh, which is what we call the cyber vault um, where you know you have a safe copy of your backup um, you can automate the process of opening the firewall, resuming replication, etc. The compromise you have to make at this point is with uh, zero data loss point of view. You have zero data loss as long as you, as you can recover from your primary recovery plans. Uh, if you recover from the vault, you can recover up to the time when it was last synchronized. So if it was synchronized like, you know, uh, six hours, uh, before the uh, the disaster happened, you know you can recover up to six hours before if you have to go to the vault. Uh, I want to you know um, restate again that the recovery plans itself can still still provides uh, a good level of resilience. So it is still possible that you recover from the primary. Um, but again, requirements, insurance companies, etc. Um, mandates the creation of a cyber vault, cyber or an air gap location. And so that's what you, you have to do. And that obviously would give an additional level of confidence and peace of mind in terms of recovery. The one thing I want to mention at this point uh, is that um, the recovery plans replication is only replicating incremental backups. We never replicate full backups. Um, the virtual full is created on the cyber vault side in the same way it's created on the primary. So this fact that we only transfer incrementals reduces tremendously the time that is needed uh, for the uh, gateway to be open, right? Uh, this also means that you can open the, the uh, gateway multiple times a day for shorter period of times because we always replicate incrementals. Um, we've been working with customers that try setting up a cyber vault with other generic solutions. Their requirement that they only had to keep the gate open for two hours maximum per day, and they couldn't make it because they had to transfer full backups during that time, etc. And the amount of data they had to transfer 
um, they couldn't make it within two hours. They were able to do it with the recovery plans for this purpose. Um, so reducing the amount the gateway is open gives you obviously less exposure to the risk because you know the, the, the longer the vault remains disconnected, the better. And but also gives you the possibility of opening it for shorter period of time, for you know multiple times, and so you have, uh, you know, most current data in the vault. That's extremely important. Extremely important. I, I have some example here for you know from customers that uh, did this and implemented uh, a cyber vault uh, with um, with the recovery plans. And okay, we cannot name names here, but. This this type of architecture and the way they implemented, et cetera, et cetera, is something that all the customers keep very um, internal because it's uh, um, it's it's a security risk, right? No one wants to uh, you know have the information on how they build their vault uh, their vault uh, become become public. So we, we we're not naming names here, but just examples, right? And it's a large, very large U.S. banks. They have two two data center. With cyber vaults, more than 500 databases, and they are using immutable, immutable backups as well for recovery of plans in the two data centers, uh, production and DR, and all of them replicating into a cyber vault uh, when we retain those backups uh, for, for a long period of time. And by the way, this is exactly the customer I was mentioning before, that they tried doing this with another solution. They were not able to uh, make it within the the two hour uh, window that basically that project that project failed. Okay. Um, another financial services company that is using a cyber vault. They only have one cyber vault. They have also primary and, and DR, obviously. Um, they are using the uh, the cyber vault for for cyber recovery, and they are using uh, ZFS to offload uh, the um, backups from the recovery plans using the uh, object storage interface on ZFS. They deployed Oracle Key Vault to protect the data, um, the encryption keys, both for the database and for their uh, backups. This is extremely important that the, the protection of the encryption keys is as important as protecting your backups, obviously, because without encryption keys, you're not going to be able to recover. So it's, it, you know, using Oracle Key Vault as a centralized key management solution is really, uh, you know, part of this overall overall solution. You don't want to mess with a with, uh, uh, file wallet on each database, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this other example instead is more in terms of uh, th this is a big uh, healthcare company, um, and this is one of the, you know, I would say option one, option two, if you want, type of architecture. Again, this customer didn't didn't want to have another recovery plans dedicated only to the cyber vault, but they were okay with using a, a ZFS storage appliance instead and uh, offloading your backups from the recovery plans to the store to the to the. ZFS uh, appliance uh, where they configured immutable policies. So you're using object storage on the ZFS um, and uh, any mutability on the ZFS. So if anyone can get access to either one of the two uh, places would not be able to delete things uh, from, from both of them. They always have a safe place where they can recover from, okay? Um, as a summary, uh, obviously, okay, I, I don't have to tell you that. I think it's clear now to everyone, but ransomware can be uh, devastating, can have a bad, bad impact on both both revenues and and um, and, and trust and reputation. And, and ransomware is becoming complex and sophisticated. Again, it's just not a piece of malware distributed somewhere without control. It's really, it's really uh, something that is increasingly complicated. Um, so these modern problems require modern data protection. Okay, so just it. This is not just backup and recovery. This is not just oh, I have my backup. So in case in case something happens, I'll recover from that. You have to plan for the specific purpose of something bad being a ransomware attack and how you recover in that case, which is not uh, not 
not as a normal restore. Uh, important, maintain uh, no, security, integrity, and availability for all the databases, including include encryption. And for this purpose, okay, the recovery plan is, you know, we think for the Oracle database, it's definitely the best solution uh, you have out, out there um, to help with building a sound uh, cyber recovery strategy. Um, I have a few links uh, here for uh, for you. Um, the first one uh, is a blog about the 23.1 software release, which is the latest software available for the recovery plans that include that feature that I mentioned earlier about being able to compress encrypted backups, which is extremely important. And then there are a number of blogs that you can find. If you if you do a search for MAA, ZDLRA blogs, you'll find all of them. Uh, some of them are specific on protecting for ransomware attack, using immutable backups, compliance, etc. So you can go ahead and go, go, go to these blogs and find more details on what I just explained. Um, there is a technical brief on cybersecurity. Uh, you can access all the past um, office hours like this one. So this one will also be published uh, there once, um, once we're done and you'll be able to review this one and the previous one. If you want to engage with us, you can uh, do it through the Ask Tom website or through Twitter and ZDRAPM is the handle. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, I don't know if there are questions that need to be addressed. Maybe Tim or Kelly, did, is there anything you want to uh, mention or answer? Otherwise, I think we are good. Um, I just pasted the links, Marco, that you referred to. Okay, so you thank you. Yeah, copy those links on chat. They're mm -hmm. all there. Are uh, good? So yeah. If there was a question know. about you know, around ZFS and what is ZFS. So ZFS is a hardware storage device. Um, I put the link in the mm -hmm. the, um, the Q and A. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Yes, it's 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 a NAS device, basically. Right? It's a it's a generic storage, and uh, certain customers have been using it for for backup uh, and, and recovery for Oracle databases uh, for a while before um, starting or introducing the recovery appliance, and so using it for long-term retention backups or through the object storage interface for immutable backup is also a good way of protecting that investment and continue using the ZFSs that we're using as a primary target for database backups before introducing the recovery plans. Okay, anything else? No, okay. Then thank you everyone and uh, we'll see you on uh, our next office hours and I will close the call. Thank you everyone.